Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine, welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are going to be talking about the edgiest kinks. Once again, we are doing a part two to that video I did a couple of weeks ago, and there were a lot of kinks I just could not get to in that video. And I have some more that I want to talk about. I have a couple that a few of you all in the comments were like, Evie, why didn't you mention this one? It's so obvious. And so we're going to be talking about all of those kinks here today. And the goal of this video is I want to talk about what these various kinks are. I want to talk about some misconceptions about them. I want to talk about why people are afraid of them or don't like them and also why people enjoy them and how you might be able to get started doing some of these kinks if you decide you want to be brave and explore them for yourself. And before I get into the ones for today I want to talk about, I think I need to give a disclaimer, which will be obvious when we get into the list why I'm doing a disclaimer. And what I need to make very clear here is that this video is not an instructional guide for how to do these kinks. I may give you some ideas at the end of each kink for like, here's what you can do if you want to try this. However, even with that, I would very, very, very highly recommend doing more research, taking classes, pursuing a mentorship with somebody who knows how to do this and can tell you and teach you how to do it directly one on one. This is generally speaking, things that are higher risk and I don't want anyone to watch a six minute segment on a YouTube video and then be like, great, I know how to do this kink now and then just go off and do it. So please be cautious, be curious, pursue education. And as long as we can keep that in mind, let's talk about some edgy kinks. So number one that I need to talk about here is fire play. And I have to be honest because fire play really just like slipped my mind. It's not a kink that I engage in very often because where I live and where I have lived over the last like couple of years, I, I don't know anywhere that allows fire play in a venue or at events or at conventions. It just is simply not a thing you really see in public. So when somebody does do fire play, it tends to be relegated to like kinky backyard barbecues or camping trips, that kind of thing. And sometimes not even then, depending on what the fire warning level is for that part of the season. So fire play, not something that I see a lot of so it's something that I don't commonly think about but I do know from other people in other parts of the country or around the world where fire play is not necessarily common but you do see it happen in public dungeons and with fire play I think there is a level of mystique around fire play because of how unusual it is it is very visual, it seems very scary, it seems very intense, and of course, if you are wanting to do kink, you might spontaneously stumble into the idea of hair pulling or spanking, but setting your partner on fire, which is a hyperbolic way of describing fire play, but that idea, generally not something that most people are just out of nowhere coming up with on their own. And so fire play education becomes very important for it being spread around the community. And when the last couple of years happened and online education became a lot more of a fixture in the BDSM community, you would see tons of classes from educators on topics that maybe in your region you wouldn't necessarily have seen a lot of or things like shibari, for example. But fire play, for whatever reason, I don't really think got that treatment. I think in all the time that I've really been closely watching online classes, I've seen like one class about fire play, but I've seen several dozen classes about like blood play, for example. So clearly education is still very much needed. But knowing that, what actually is fire play? Because it is not 
setting your partner on fire. I would say that fire play in the BDSM community, from my experience of it, tends to take broadly three common forms. There is fire flushing, fire drumming, and fire cupping. And fire flushing is definitely related to the how would I would how would I describe this? The alternative performance art that you see with like fire eating and fire flushing in that realm. Oftentimes, if you're looking for fire play equipment online, literally the same stores will sell equipment both for kinky fire play as well as performative fire art and dance work. And with fire flushing in a kink context, the main difference with this is that instead of it being done on yourself, like you're doing it to yourself as part of a performance, somebody else is generally doing it to you. You can do it as solo play, though I don't really know anyone that does that, but it can be done. And with fire flushing, the idea is, is generally you take some kind of purpose-built instrument that has fuel on it, you light that on fire, and then you very quickly run it against the skin literally for a second or two, and then you wipe it away and make sure that it's clear. You're not leaving it lingering on the skin. The intention of the play is not to create burns. It's about having a warm and intense sensation briefly. And we'll talk more about the feeling and sensation of fire play in a moment. But fire drumming is very similar to fire flushing, but more or less it's self-explanatory, like you're drumming on your partner and you are using flame to create sensation while also doing that. And then finally you have fire cupping, which is different, I would say, in quite a large way from these other two forms of playing with fire. Fire cupping is more based on traditional medicinal cupping, where the idea is, is you create suction over a part of the skin, and that is supposed to have some kind of healing property to it. And certainly some people in the kink community will have this connection between like alternative medicine and spirituality and their kink and use it all together for that reason. But usually in the kink community, we're doing it for the sensation aspect. And essentially, you take a cup, you briefly expose it to flame, that creates an area of suction, and then you put it on the surface of the skin, and then I'm gonna make a reference, and I don't know how many people are gonna get it, but it's from Avatar The Last Airbender, and it's, I think it's a, it's a pentapus? There's like an octopus in the show at some point that like gloms onto the characters and leaves marks on them, and I mean, I guess actually with a real octopus too, this would probably happen as well, but like you get big circular bruising marks on the skin depending on how intense the suction is and how long you leave the cup on that one spot for. You can use it just to have it be in one place, you can move it around. I have a whole other video where I talk about various forms of cupping, but with fire cupping, that's what you're trying to do. Again, it can vary in intensity level. And if you struggle with being able to get a bruise, Fire cupping is a really good way to basically guarantee that that happens. So fire cupping, definitely a fun experience. I actually think it's really good as if you're going to a convention, for example, and you have the opportunity to do this, even with just like non-fire cupping, having this be like a day two activity where, you know, like the first night at the dungeon, you have like the really big produced scene. And then like when you're feeling a little bit more lazy, lazy top, lazy bottom on day two because you're so tired from all the amazing events. You pull out the cups, you have a great scene, you get some marks too, and you can also use it to relax your muscles. So it just overall, lots of good things going on with fire cupping. But as I've been mentioning, fire play is not setting your partner on fire and it is risky still though. Like it's not something that is totally without risk Obviously, whenever you are dealing with open flames and fuel and the human body and clothes and hair and all of that, you are potentially going to be dealing with burned hair, burns on the skin, melted clothing, generally things that we want to avoid in our play. So be cautious with fire play to be sure and take classes about it if you want to learn about this. Really take your time to understand fire play and respect fire if you're going to be playing with it. But for people that enjoy fire play, it can be for so many different reasons. Fear play, certainly for one, that mental aspect of like this very intense scary thing is right there and it's going to be on me on purpose, like that's a lot to deal with. There is that just very basic primal connection to fire and a lot of people like playing with that 
in their primal play in a more controlled way than maybe you would see with for example, more like rough body play focused primal play, but that primal connection to fire can be part of it. It can also be a way of demonstrating a very deep level of submission. I think very similarly to a lot of blood play where I trust you so much, I am letting you do this super dangerous thing to my body. So there's a lot that goes into fire play. There's also the exhibitionist elements of it. There's also the performance aspect to it. And as a dom or as a top, big power trip to be able to put fire to somebody's body and then have that turn out okay. So lots of good things here, like uh, like even probably like dragon role play, dragon pet play <laughs> could be part of fire play as well. So lots of options with that. If you do wanna get started with fire play, I'd recommend trying to check out maybe like some kind of fire-based performance art near you, watch it first, maybe do something like wax play. I actually think that fire play when I've done it is less intense than wax play can be, but I think when you're playing with more extreme temperature and like higher levels of hotter temperature, fire play and wax play can end up being fairly similar. And also you have to learn how to manage things like having an open flame, depending on the style of wax play that you're doing. And also if you want to play with, for example, like fire drumming, you might start doing something like that by taking a pair of big metal cooking chopsticks, soaking them in very hot water, and then using them while wearing gloves to like drum on your partner's body and then have that experience of something like very hot, quickly touching your skin. Of course, it's not going to maintain heat the same way that an actual flame would, but it can start to somewhat replicate that and give you an idea of what experiencing that impact plus temperature might end up feeling like. But moving on, this is already very long. I'm giving like basically huge summaries of all these forms of play. So I'm gonna try to be brief about this, but it's hard to be brief because number two is breath control. And I have to talk about this because there is simply no other kink that is as popular and as risky as breath control is. It is so popular that it's barely even a kink now because it's literally sweeping through college campuses. People love breath control. And usually when I say breath control, most people just think of like hand on throat choking. I'm not limiting this to that. I'm talking about anything that controls the breath. That could be a plug nose, a hand over the mouth, using some kind of device to do that. Like there's a wide spectrum of risk level when it comes to breath control. And it's actually kind of interesting because normally people would assume that choking works by arresting your ability to breathe. But typically in the kink community, when people are choking, they're doing a blood choke as opposed to an air choke. And when vanilla people are doing it, as I found from some recent studies and analysis, Oftentimes, what people that are vanilla mean by choking is they just like having a hand on their throat, not necessarily having any pressure, but that experience of a hand on the throat, which really just makes all of this more complicated because we glom all of these very different activities together into one big label, like having a plastic bag over your head versus somebody putting a hand to your throat. I think we can agree those are generally pretty different activities. And I feel like I don't even really need to explain why people are into breath play because I imagine 90% of the people watching this video are gonna be into it, but I'll just give you a few examples for why people say they like breath play. I think it's a very visceral, physical, vulnerable, personal thing. It's something that mentally is very difficult for a lot of people to process doing, to be sure. But if you are somebody that relates to it in a positive way, that sensation of losing control over that or feeling like you might lose control over that is extremely intense and very hard to replicate doing anything else in kink. I think like with fire play, like with blood play, it's a very submissive act for a lot of people as well because you trust your partner so much, you are giving up control over the very air that you breathe and when you breathe. Clearly a lot of people would find that intoxicating. And for people that enjoy playing at the edges and like pushing past their own comfort level as much as possible, 
Breath control is a really easy, clear way to do that. And of course, for some people, just having a hand on the throat with or without pressure, for some reason, just sets off this feeling in their brain where it's like, whoo, instant, blissy subspace time. So for a lot of people, it's a quick ticket to subspace town and there's a reason why it's a popular go-to choice for doms that are still learning the way of things and then they go right for the throat and they're like, oh, this gets me a good reaction, I'm gonna keep doing this. I have thoughts about that, but that is for a different video and not this one. But regardless of what kind of breath control you're doing or choking for that matter, there is a very high level of risk associated with this type of play. A million different things can go wrong. You can faint and you can hit your head on a hard floor or on the corner of a nightstand or a bunch of other stuff, right? Like breath control is very, very risky. I can't get into all of the reasons why it's risky right now that would take a whole video all on its own, but there is a reason why it is commonly banned from public venues, from dungeons, from events. It's a very, very high level of liability that most places simply do not want to be a part of. But there's also a lot of very valid common reasons for why people don't like breath control. Like there are people that have an automatic positive response to it, there are also people that have an automatic negative response to it where their brain overrides everything else and goes, absolutely the heck not, no, we are getting out of here, we do not like this. And there can be a temptation to want to lower this response threshold. I feel like if you want to do that, that's the domain of like professional mental health help. I'm not gonna give advice about doing that or not. I would generally advise against it. I think it's a good thing that your body wants to protect you from danger. If you think you might be overreacting or over responding, that's gonna need a professional's input on whether or not that's a good idea or necessary or to what degree. So instead of trying to bulldoze through your hard no feelings, I recommend if you wanna play with this, working around it a little bit, right? Like maybe what you like is the intense submissive feeling of having a hand around your throat but you can't actually handle having a hand around your throat. Maybe instead what you'll do is you will have a hand on your jaw or on the back of your neck or pulling your hair, doing something that gives you that feeling of head control without actually getting into the more negative aspects of having somebody put hands around your neck. Maybe what you enjoy is having the sensation of losing control over your breath, but you don't want the high level of risk associated with some other forms of breath control. This is not without risk, but it is something to look into. Maybe what you might enjoy more is having your nose plugged or having a hand over your mouth or wearing a gag that has an insertable attachment to it where you feel that loss of control over your throat, over your ability to breathe completely, but not totally, right? Like, I guess that sounds confusing, but I mean like you're losing like your ability to breathe through your nose, but you can still breathe through your mouth. Like you're losing part of it, you're playing with that, but it's not the same level again of like, you know, putting a bag over your head, for example. Or maybe what you enjoy is the feeling of not being able to escape and being totally dominated, in which case I might recommend something like a leather pillowcase or a heavy cotton pillowcase that is breathable. You can put that over your head like an old fashioned medieval hood and without adding anything else to it, it starts to feel very claustrophobic and maybe that's bad for you, but maybe that's good. And you know that you can still breathe, like it's not perfectly sealed or anything, you're not tying anything around the neck or using a collar on top of it, you're just having the hood over you, but you get that sense of like, I'm closed in, I'm not able to move, I can't go anywhere, and that can produce that sense of panic and fear that maybe you wanna play with and it's just an alternative way to get to that same experience. But with all of these though, I have to say, none of them are totally risk-free. I recommend doing further education, learning more about this, taking classes where and when possible, and just understanding that none of this is totally, totally safe, and you have to be your own judge over what level of risk you are willing to take on. But moving on, let's talk about our third edgiest kink for this video, and that would be 
hypnosis. And whereas with breath control, people tend to have very loud and open feelings about it, either very positive or very negative, I feel like hypnosis is a kink that people tend to be more silently judgmental about. Like, let's say somebody's having a conversation and they talk to somebody about the fact they're into hypnosis and it's something they enjoy doing in kink, oftentimes the person may be thinking, hypnosis, that doesn't work. That person is like off their rocker. What are they doing? They clearly don't know what they're talking about and they kind of roll their eyes in their head and they don't they don't get it. They don't get why somebody could be into hypnosis because it doesn't do anything. It's just all make-believe. What are you doing? But other people have very strong negative opinions about hypnosis and consider it to be highly dangerous to the point where no one should ever be doing any kind of hypnosis because of how bad it can be in terms of negative outcomes. And they think that hypnosis is basically a way to let somebody into your mind and give them complete control and that you would have no way to ever stop it. And clearly that is so risky that no one should ever be learning about it, teaching it, or engaging in it. As usual, the truth is a little bit more complicated than either one of those two statements make it out to be. And I'm not gonna be on this channel and argue about like if hypnosis is real or not. I don't really know. Like I haven't personally done studies about hypnosis in a kink context, but I do have an older forgotten interview with Mark Wiseman about hypnosis. And I imagine that it got suppressed and demonetized because the topic is hypnosis. I am risking that happening to this video as well by talking about hypnosis at all because the censorship around hypnosis is it, it, it really honestly goes to another level that I thought wasn't possible. Like hypnosis is very difficult to find information about online, but if you do wanna learn more about it and why people think it works, you can watch the interview. I will say that for people I know that do hypnosis, all of them are very convinced that it works both as a top and as a bottom and you can choose to agree with that or not. But what is the reality behind hypnosis. Why do people actually enjoy hypnosis? And I think like a lot of these edgier kinks, it really goes back to a desire to lose control, right? If you are letting somebody into your mind and letting them play around a bit, that's a pretty intense loss of control that goes beyond just a physical way of losing control. They're in your mind. Being able to mesmerize someone is a powerful tool for an emotionally driven dominant or sadist. For people as well, I'll talk about this, people that enjoy hypnosis, a lot of them that I talk to, some of them will learn about hypnosis later on into their kink journey, but for a lot of people, they always had a fascination with hypnosis because they saw it in a cartoon or a TV show or a movie, and then they want to be able to do it. And it started as something they enjoyed when they were younger, and then as they got older and were starting to find themselves in their adult way of relating, they got into hypnosis through a desire to replicate what they had developed a fascination for as a younger person. But one other thing that's a really big benefit with hypnosis is that it expands the limits of what you can play with in kink. You don't need to have any expensive equipment or a private dungeon space or toys or role play costumes or anything like that. You can play entirely with your mind. It is like the ultimate DIY kink. If you want to do basically any kind of fantasy scenario, you can do it with hypnosis, no matter how wild and wacky it is, right? Like if you want to be a mermaid that's been captured by a group of pirates and then put on a pyre in front of an active volcano, like congrats, you can do that with the power of hypnosis. You can really use this to create some very powerful, interesting, unique scenes. And if you're somebody that has very edgy kinks or kinks that you can only really do one time in real life, Hypnosis can be a way to explore those more dangerous, involved kinks without actually having to really do them. And because of the fact it plays with essentially the theater of the mind, it's a great tool for long distance DS relationships because 
You can do it with audio files. You can do it with video files. You can do it over a Zoom call probably if you wanted to. Like hypnosis is something you can do with many different forms, both in person and in long distance. And also you can do it both in short-term and long-term ways. Oftentimes hypnosis scenes are just that scenes, but people will also use them as tools in long-term relationships to maybe help people change certain behaviors or develop new habits. However, that is a higher level of risk to be clear. I'm not saying you should go out and find somebody to do that to you tomorrow, but it is something that people will play with. And I get why people would be afraid of hypnosis. A lot of the fear around hypnosis is due to how intense people think it must be, how when you're letting somebody into your mind, that's not really a door you can ever close. Like, do you really trust your partner enough to let them into you in that way? And I totally understand and respect why people would not want to play with hypnosis. But if you do want to play with hypnosis, you don't actually have to start with hypnosis at all. I might begin by listening to some ASMR role play stuff. You know, find a scenario that you really enjoy, listen to it, practice what it's like to get into that headspace, that world that is being painted by the person that is doing the ASMR. And you can use it as a way to explore those fantasies without actually having to worry about getting your brain messed with or being in trance or how that might make you feel. And if you do want to explore getting into hypnosis, I might recommend doing some self-hypnosis. As I've said, censorship around hypnosis makes it very difficult to find high quality files and things that are easily accessible to people that are not you know, looking for very particular expensive custom hypnosis stuff, but you can definitely find some self-hypnosis tips. There are literally vanilla books you can get from the self-help section probably to this very day that are about self-hypnosis for things like quitting smoking. And you can take those principles into kink and use them to create scenarios you wanna work with. There's also self-hypnosis videos that are very similar to ASMR that introduce you to that principle. But that is what I would start with is if you wanna do it, if you wanna do it as a dom or top too, Self-hypnosis as a way to experience what it's like to be hypnotized, I think is a great way to go so that way you know what your partner is going to be experiencing and what it's like for you to experience it, just in the same way that it's a good idea to like practice your new toy on yourself before you use it on somebody else. That is generally what I recommend, but hypnosis with everything, like anything else on this list, do your research, go slowly. If something doesn't feel safe or right to you, don't do it. And yeah. Moving on to number four, this is like as opposite from hypnosis as it could possibly be. Punching and face slapping. So basically extreme body play. And did you even know in the kink scene that there are people that are really into being punched or being slapped in the face? You might not. A lot of people do not realize that this is a form of play and that people engage in it. And this is something that people have very strong reactions to when they hear about it. Case in point, a couple of weeks ago on FetLife, there was a huge debate started over somebody talking about their experiences with a kink like this, and it turned into a multi-day conversation about kink shaming and whether or not certain kinks are really permissible, even with consent, and what if certain kinks are really just mistreatment of a person, even if they are done with consent. And that was a very large conversation. And I think it's interesting to think about how we mentally process as a community, certain forms of intense stimulus as being very different from other forms of intense stimulus. And I don't think it's difficult to see why this became such a big conversation. I think it's something that people do consider to be riskier than a lot of other forms of play. And on a psychological level, not just a physical one, right? Where if you allow someone to hit you this way, what does that mean about you? What does that mean about your partner? How does that affect your relationship, right? Even if people know that it is done with permission and enjoyed and consensual, they just can't get over mentally how that resembles. 
things that might happen in a bad relationship. Or it could be something that they have negative experiences with themselves. Like if you were physically bullied growing up, if you had a bad relationship with your parents, if you experienced certain forms of violence, you probably don't want to replicate that in your kink and hearing other people are doing it for fun might be pretty upsetting. But for people that are into stimulus like this, the appeal is easily apparent, right? Like some people who like rough body play, for example, they prefer their rough body play to be as real as possible. They want it to be like an MMA fight and not like a stage fight. People that are heavy masochists and heavy bottoms, they enjoy play like this because it can be very, very intense and very painful in a way that you can't really get to with, for example, a caning or a paddling. Also with punching specifically, it creates a very deep thuddy sensation. And it is hard to get a lot of thuddy sensation from a lot of the more common tools and toys out there. I know for myself, I was able to discover my own personal routine way of getting to subspace thanks to things like punching. And for things like face slapping, there is that very common through line we've been seeing of this being a way to show devotion, of it being a very high level of submission because you are trusting your partner to literally hit you in the face and slap you around and have that be a positive, good experience. And like similarly, what we saw with breath control, with things like face slapping, that can also be a one-way ticket to subspace town for a lot of people. For some reason, even if it's very light, gentle tapping, it just puts them in the headspace where whoop, they go right there and that's why they enjoy doing it is because it's a great way to get in that mindset they want to be able to get to. And rough body play, of course, is still risky. Punching is risky. Face slapping is risky. You have to deal with things like the head and just like a lot of things can very much go wrong but thankfully there are lots of ways to get training and do classes that help you learn how to do this in a safer way whether that be vanilla classes and things like martial arts for example or self-defense classes and in the kink community classes around stuff like this are becoming increasingly common i just recently went to a convention where there were no fewer than three classes that dealt with punching, grappling, rough body play, wrestling, things of that nature. So it's becoming easier and easier to get information about things like this in a kink context. But if you're curious and you do want to explore things like this, you don't have to start out doing anything too wild, right? I think you can treat something like punching done in the correct way as being somewhat similar to spanking, for example. You can start out with very, very light pressure, basically tapping over somebody's clothing, on their butt, on their thighs, on a really meaty part of the body, and it can end up being very massagey and actually not really that extreme depending on how you're doing it. And you can slowly ramp up that intensity until you're at the level that you wanna be at. And then with face slapping, as I've said, you don't have to start out doing anything super out there, right? You can do very, very, very light, like tapping touch like this, like, like barely any force at all, but just like letting the person know that you're touching them. Also pinching, pinching on the cheeks. That's another very intense way of playing with the cheeks that can be painful. You can get your nails in there if you want to. That's something that you are okay with having, you know, nail marks in your cheeks over, but like you can play with the cheeks and play with pain around there without actually having to do full on face slapping. And again, I do recommend taking classes about this whenever possible and practicing a lot before you do this to anybody else. But let's move on to number five, because I think this one is hotly anticipated by some of the viewers of this video. Let's talk about diapers because diapers are a very, special kind of edge play for a lot of people. Like a diaper by itself seems very innocuous. It's not really physically risky, but people have a revulsion towards it that is something that I cannot say I've seen with basically any other form of kink. And a lot of people have strong feelings about diapers because, for example, maybe they're a little and they resent the just 
squishing down into one big ball that some people will do with like CGL and DDLG and ABDL and diaper kinks and age play and just kind of like putting them all together as though they are all synonymous with each other and then oh well you're a little so therefore you must wear diapers and then a lot of people just do not want to have anything at all to do with diapers and they are more than happy to make their feelings known about that but there are people that are just viscerally disgusted by diapers they do not enjoy them at all the bodily fluid aspect of it the idea that there could be bodily fluids involved the fact there is this connection for a lot of people to childhood even with something like adult diapers they just don't want to have that connection or connotation to their kink whatsoever it tends to follow I think a negative stereotype we sometimes see about the kink community where I certainly know of a couple of pieces of media where an ABDL is shown as being representative of the kink community and it's not usually positive it's usually played for laughs it's usually pretty negative and so people want to distance themselves from that association I think people like they have a very negative view of diapers and people who wear them they find it disgusting and questionable they just do not understand why somebody would be into diapers and they do not want to have to be around them but for people that enjoy diapers there are many reasons for why this happens a lot of people find diapers to be comforting they find it to be something that is relaxing especially in the context of the ritual act of being diapered having this whole routine process of the diaper and the baby powder and being on the table if they have one and like the caretaker doing it for them like they enjoy that whole process and having that rhythm that routine of doing it is something that helps them like cope with life stress for example for people that had negative childhood experiences or were bullied for wetting the bed or having to wear a diaper longer than other kids did in the preschool like it might be something that's very healing for people to explore and get to recapture that experience and reframing it similar to a lot of other edgier kinks that involve psychology and role play and of course i can't ignore the fact that for a lot of folk they enjoy wearing diapers because they they have a fettuccine they have a fettuccine for it and that is just something they want to have in their life because oh boy do they love eating fettuccine hopefully you all can tell what i am saying by that but there you go. A diaper can also be used for bondage or humiliation. There are devices you can get for a diaper that transform it from just being a plain old diaper into part of a full on bondage scene where it's locked on and you can't remove it yourself. And with humiliation, there is the embarrassment that can come from being forced to wear a diaper as an adult or have other aspects of wearing a diaper humiliated. And though that can be a negative emotion, for people that enjoy humiliation, that negative emotion is the experience they want to have. And so if you are intrigued by potentially playing around with diapers and having that be something you try out, I might recommend, like is usual for this list, not starting with diapers directly, at least not at first. I think there are other options for what you can do. For example, you might make a makeshift cloth diaper as opposed to buying full on adult diapers. You might have something you can use as sort of pseudo training pants to have an in-between between like regular adult underwear and having something that is a full-on diaper and if you do want to get into wearing a diaper for a period of time i recommend just putting it on maybe focusing more on the ritual aspect of putting on the diaper and how that can be a relaxing maybe even meditative process for you and then like not keeping it on for a long period of time not wearing it around the house not going out with it just practice what it feels like to be wearing the diaper for a short period of time and then take it off process debrief the partner if you're doing this with a partner and then go from there and with that being said that's everything i have to say about 
five more of the edgiest kinks in BDSM. I would love to know what you all think in a comment down below. Also, if you do any of these kinks, what do you think about this? How do you do them? How'd you get into doing that kink? Any and all thoughts, I'd love to hear in a comment down below. And if you've not already, please do subscribe to my channel. I make videos twice a week about all sorts of different kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way to do that is with Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already, support me there. Thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.